Welcome to the next generation of Wall Street Week, bringing you stories of capitalism, stories that will help you think about business, markets, economics, geopolitics, climate, and technology. This week, we tell a story of the pride of an auto industry and its home city, pride that led to their fall and their efforts to restore that pride. We have a story about the business behind that restaurant where you feel like you belong. We start with a story about value, the value of a college degree, one of the biggest investments many of us will ever make. But it's getting more and more expensive for the students and for the institutions. But is it worth it? Yes, 100%. I mean, you know, financial considerations is the main motive, and Purdue is an affordable college. Um, but yeah, no, I could have never imagined having access to the amount of resources that I have access to here. Rebecca Siener is a rising junior at Purdue. She pays about $41,000 a year as an out-of-state student, just over the national average of $36,000, a number that's gone up 40% since 2004, with students like Siener making ends meet through a combination of grants, scholarships, and federal loans. I am very appreciative of the scholarship and grant Purdue has offered me. I would not be able to be here without it. As hard as it may be for many students and their families to cover the costs, historically, colleges and universities haven't had to worry all that much about what they charge. The cost of higher education rose faster than the cost of living for most of the last 40 years, something interrupted only by the big spike in inflation in 2022. But Mitch Daniels, who ran OMB and then served as governor of Indiana and as president of Purdue, says that is changing that people are no longer willing to spend whatever colleges charge. The system sort of built for a higher pricing. I mean, uh, if you uh, had total pricing power in any business, uh, in other words, you could raise prices and you not only don't lose customers, you may gain more because there's no quality measurement. People have associated the price with quality, no proof that that's true. That's certainly one reason. The hardest business to change is one that's succeeded for a long time. And this model, if you call it that, was very successful, had the wind at its back, young people being told you got to go to college, four-year college, and um, they followed the path of least resistance. Now, very belatedly, there's a little consumer resistance. Finally, slowly, the market has begun to uh, react to that. So you're seeing now a system beginning to experience the shakeouts that other sectors have. The shakeouts Mitch Daniels talks about are becoming more common in the United States as colleges have cut programs, places like UNC Greensboro, Drake, and West Virginia University. The State Higher Education Executive Association reports that over 500 private, nonprofit, four-year colleges have closed down altogether in the last 10 years. Some American students look to Great Britain for an alternative, seeing high quality at much lower prices. But Jillian Tad, who has added provost of King's College Cambridge to her responsibilities as U.S. editor-at-large at the Financial Times, says British schools are facing their own financial pressures. The challenge today is that, essentially, the numbers have exploded dramatically, which in many ways is a good thing, but it also means that there's a huge strain on public sector budgets, which at the moment the government simply can't pay the bill for all the students to have cheap education, let alone free education. So what universities are facing today is a squeeze where, on the one hand, they are allowed to charge students today for their tuition, but that's capped at £9,000 a year. And even that level, which looks very low to American eyes, is seen as grotesquely high by many people in the UK. As if the business model for higher education weren't challenged enough, its consumers, the students, and the parents are starting to doubt that they're getting good value for their money, at least in the United States, where polls indicate that only 36% of adults say they have a great deal, or quite a lot, of confidence in higher education, a number that's down from 57% in 2015. Is the system succeeding right now? And what is the goal? How do we measure success for yeah. higher education? Well, when I said succeeding, I meant they were, they were able to perpetuate their, themselves in their institutions. I didn't mean it was necessarily succeeding for the students. That's a whole other uh, question, which, again, uh, way too late is being uh, asked uh, more and more forcefully. But, um, no, a whole other discussion whether the system, as we have been operating it, has been teaching what it ought to teach, teaching it as rigorously as it ought to be taught, 
and therefore whether the young people emerging meet either of, I would say, the two basic tests of success. One, are they ready for highly productive work somewhere in the economy? Two, are they prepared to be knowledgeable, engaged, uh, active citizens? And uh, by those two measures, we haven't, the system hasn't been doing, in general, too good a job. The question of whether an increasingly expensive college education is truly worth it is being asked on both sides of the Atlantic. The explosion of digital technologies, the rise of AI, the rise of homeworking means that the question of what we're educating for is becoming increasingly unclear. And it's worth remembering that so much of what we've had as higher education and secondary education in the last century was created very much post the Industrial Revolution in order to prepare a workforce um, to either manage factories or work in a factory and to have the discipline and the skills required for that. And today, of course, manufacturing is such a small part of the economy that the question of what we're educating for is becoming increasingly uncertain and challenged. It should come as no surprise that given the challenges to the value of higher education, leaders are looking to make changes. Eight years ago, Mitch Daniels shook things up at Purdue, freezing tuition just two months into his job, something that continues to this day. When you were on Purdue, what business principles did you try to bring to bear in managing? I'd love to tell you it was some brilliant uh, set of brilliant strokes. It wasn't. A lot of it had to do with what question you ask. I used to say, we, we, saw, we decided we solved the, question, the equation for zero. Instead of asking, how much money do we need next year to keep operating and keep peace and happiness on the campus, we asked the question, what would we have to do this year not to raise tuition? What combination of things? It's not hard to find them if, if you make that your goal. Capital spending is one place to look. It's, uh, you can have very first-rate facilities without the gold plating that I've seen in so many other uh, places. If you watch things carefully, like staff-to-student ratios, faculty to administrator ratios, things like that. It's not hard, as I say, to uh, pick the low fruit. One of those places where the fruit may be hanging low is in the administrative staff. I look at these schools that astonishingly have more administrators than students. I mean, a lot of that could disappear. I used to say to people, uh, you'd be amazed how much government you'd never miss. But as is the case elsewhere, it's awfully hard to cut your way to success. In the end, it comes back to providing a service, a product of real and sustainable value, one tailored for today that will leave you in good stead well into the future. Twelve years ago, on my arrival, more than 40 percent of the students were already studying a STEM discipline. Today, it's closer to two-thirds, and the student body is 30 percent bigger. But those are students' choices. The students are seeing that these are exciting things to learn, exciting careers beyond them. And um, we uh, responded to what we thought was going to be that demand. And yes, for Mitch Daniels, one investment that is well worth the price paid is an education in business, something that at Purdue is now granted by the Mitch Daniels School of Business. We sensed a growing appetite, and I think this is positive, of students who want to study business and hope, and hope to have a career there. Uh, first of all, um, uh, I want them to be grounded in a little broader way than much business education today is. They'll have read some economic history, some economic philosophy. They'll have been able to compare systems. They'll make up their own minds, which system is uh, better for the vast majority of people. But uh, they ought to know something about that, not just how to read a balance sheet yeah, or how to you know, calculate an NPV. Beyond that, I want them to leave with a sense that this career they've chosen is a noble one. Over at King's College, Cambridge, Jillian Ted is similarly focused on making sure that students are being prepared for a world transformed by technology, but not defined by it. British higher education is starting to play around with online learning, partly as a result of COVID. But the path that Oxford and Cambridge are going down, and most of the other British universities, is to say that there is a real value in face-to-face -face education not just because it's chat GPT resistant, um, because it is actually, by the way, um, but also because face-to-face -face education gives kids the skills they're going to really need for the future, such as the ability to get along with people they might disagree with, such as the ability to present an argument, but to have a Socratic debate, which doesn't just take one side. And any higher education establishment that can teach kids to not just be able to amass knowledge, in a computer, but also the skills to navigate people will have an advantage. 
So we used to talk about the digital divide being between kids who knew about tech skills and kids who don't. Today, there's another digital divide, which is the kids who know about tech skills but can still talk to humans effectively and manage them and be creative as a human. They will be the really advantaged ones in the future. However the leaders running higher education sort it all out, the one thing they agree on is that although it's a business, we must never lose sight of the fact that it's also much more than a business. It's a mission, and it's something which is much higher than any commercialization mantra would suggest. And we need to keep that in mind above all else. We're really investing in kids, but not just in money, in all kinds of other ways as well. And yes, we need to pay the bills, but it cannot be just about paying the bills. It's fundamentally about championing the source of ideas creation and learning. Higher education is not supposed to be a business. I used to say the same thing about government, but it can be much more business-like. It just didn't have to in too many cases until recently. I hope we don't overreact, though, because the college degree as we've known it, if it's well done, I think is still a, a tremendous, there's still a great return on that very expensive investment. But in the end, the question of whether a college education gives value that justifies the cost is for those receiving it to decide. People like Becca Siener. I think the personal growth and professional development that Purdue has offered me is definitely going to take me to you know, a, a good career or grad school. Next on Wall Street Week, the story of a city and an industry fighting to regain their pride. This is a story about pride. Pride on the way up, pride that comes before a fall, and what it takes to restore the pride of a business, an industry, and a city when they've lost their way. Our Bloomberg radio colleague, Michael Barr, is a native of Detroit who watched his city burn during the riots of 1967 as a once great economic hub entered a period of decline. I'm gonna give away my age, because that happened in 67. And I was three years old, and I was in Southwest Detroit. And at the time, I saw the National Guard in a Jeep go by. Now, being a stupid kid, I'm thinking, oh, G.I. Joe. I didn't realize that the daggone city is burning down. Between that, how the auto industry really took a hard nosedive. The story of Detroit is all the more dramatic given what it had once been, the motor city that helped drive the U.S. economy. Auto production once accounted for almost 5% of U.S. GDP and nearly a million jobs. At its peak, Detroit was the fourth largest city in the nation. That would have been a happy story if it had ended there, but it didn't. Rising costs, new competition, particularly from Japanese automakers, and an oil crisis hit the industry hard, reducing U.S. auto industry employees by more than a third in 30 years from more than 900,000 in 1950 to around 600,000 by 1982. Today, automobile production accounts for under 3% of U.S. GDP, and Detroit has fallen from fourth to 26th in the ranks of U.S. cities. According to current Ford CEO Jim Farley, an entire industry, including his own Ford Motor, had failed to see and respond to the changes happening around it. I think, you know, World War II is a big challenge for the company. And when Henry Ford II led the company back to a revitalized state through the whiz kids, we hired all these logistics experts from the Army after the World War II, and they really created this kind of bureaucratic but eff incredibly efficient machine. And the company was back in the 60s. And then the energy crisis came. The company didn't have efficient vehicles. It wasn't competitive among quality, and it really lost its way in the 70s, as well as the city of Detroit after the riots and, um, you know, we, we were lost. And from there, things just got worse. I'm 65 years old and the city of Detroit has lost population every year I've been alive until last year. So that was a lot of years of uh, auto plants moving out, restaurants moving out, movie theaters moving out, people uh, moving out. What was Detroit's lowest point, do you think? Oh, I think probably bankruptcy in 2013 was rock bottom, but we had a lot of bad years before that. By the end of the 20th century, it was hard to remember where it had all started back in 1896 when Henry Ford invented his quadricycle 
and then moved quickly to found the company he named after himself in Detroit, introducing his iconic Model T in 1908, and then inventing the first moving assembly line, which went on to produce 20 million of those Model Ts in the 1920s. My grandfather's a good example. You know, he was an educated man, but he had a great job at Ford and built his family. His kids went to college eventually, and just like your family. My family was one of those affected by Ford, where my dad went to work in lower level management in the 1960s and continued until cutbacks in the 1990s led him to take a buyout. But long before my dad went to work there, long before it all went south, Detroit erected an emblem of the growth and strength of the new auto industry, the Michigan Central Station. At its peak, over 200 passenger trains left that station every day, carrying over 4,000 passengers, and another 3,000 people worked in the office tower above the station. I see Detroit through the eyes of a kid who remembers a beautiful city. I remembered a beautiful train station. Michigan Central continued its reign well into the 1950s when Detroit was the home to some two million people. But then the American auto industry went into a long period of decline as auto plant after auto plant began to shut down. It was heartbreaking over the years to see Dodge Main close, to see Cadillac Fleetwood close uh, and the jobs that went with them and they went to the suburbs and eventually they went to, to Mexico. As the auto industry went, so went Michigan Central. The last Amtrak train left the station in 1988, leaving the Detroit landmark to fall into disuse and decay, its windows broken, its roof open to the sky, its marble scavenged. With the windows gone, the air blowing through, it was depressing every single time you came into town on the freeway. By 2013, the Detroit City Council had voted to tear the train station down, and it took a determined Mayor Duggan leading a group of Detroiters to restore Michigan Central to what it is again. From my first day in office, getting that train station reoccupied was a central focus. There was no way it was going to be uh, demolished. It just meant too much to too many generations. And so my first month, Matt Maroon, the owner, was in my office, had a list of things that they wanted. And I said, I want one thing. I want you to put windows in that abandoned train station. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, all people see when they look at that train station is blight. I remember when it was beautiful. And so we made a deal on some other things where they spent a million dollars to put in windows. And when the windows started to go in, it had an electric effect in the city. Everybody driving by on the freeway said, oh my God. To bring Michigan Central and Detroit back from the brink, it took more than private industry and government. Darren Walker runs the foundation the Ford family created in the 1930s, and he helped lead philanthropies like his to step in. The crisis of 2013 was uh, significant, to say the least. The malfeasance that was committed was shocking and criminal. And of course, the city found itself in this very odd situation with the museum being an asset uh, of the city, which was a debtor. The Ford Foundation made the first uh, grant, $125 million of that 400 uh, that uh, helped, I believe, to incent others to join. And it was one of my proudest moments. But above all, Detroit needed the auto industry to come back, to set aside the pride that had caused it to underestimate its foreign competitors for too long, and to take a hard look at what those competitors were doing better than they were. Where I worked at Toyota, a young person with my family from Detroit, that was the best car company when I graduated from business school. You know, efficient um, and really focused on the customer. And we became the best-selling car with Camry because we had a better car. And it was built in Kentucky. You know, ultimately, the competition in America, it's a free society, is going to be, you know, open market. But ultimately, ultimately, in the end of the day as a CEO, I have to be completely competitive on quality and cost to their quality and cost. Take out all the subsidies, all the tariffs, we have to be fully competitive. If you look at the company, this has happened many, many times. 
It's a company that's been through a lot, but here we are. There's, I think, 50 companies that have survived after 50, the 50s to be still here. Um, the average company now, big companies, stays on the stock exchange for like 20 years. You know, we've been there for every year. So it's a company, though, that when it gets its back against the wall, something magical happens. Where are you on the road back? How far along that road are you? Our, our, our backs are off the stovepipes. Ford, along with GM and Stellantis, has clawed its way back from the worst of it, with the three automakers selling over six million units in the United States last year and reaping more than a half a trillion dollars in revenue. They're profitable again, with Ford making over $4 billion in net income in 2023, all of which has brought jobs back as well. Michigan unemployment peaked, apart from the pandemic, in 1982 at 16.6%, .6%, well above the national average. Last year, it had fallen all the way down to 3.6%. Done, as Mayor Duggan explains, one plant at a time. But when I started, I sat with Bill Ford, I sat with Mary Barra, and I sat then with Sergio Marchione, who was running Fiat Chrysler, and I said, look, if Detroit's gonna come back, we've gotta come back on our strength. We're not gonna be the tech hub, the biomedical hub. The next time you cite a parts plant, please, asked them to come talk to me first. And it was Bill Ford, who was the first one, had Flex and Gate, made parts for Ford trucks. Ultimately, we landed a Jeep plant with 5,000 employees, uh, almost all Detroiters being hired. So that was terrific, because I had a large number of unemployed who had high school degrees, and we needed good paying manufacturing jobs. Now, with the University of Michigan grad school being built, uh, we are now competing for the tech jobs, the jobs of the future. Uh, and and that's exciting as well because in this city we need both. We need the people building the cars. We also need people designing the jobs of the future. And on 14th Street next to the train station is the only public street in America where the road charges your car. We have a self-charging road while you park there because the coils underneath will charge it. That's what we're doing. It's the technology of the future. Now, once again, as it did over a hundred years ago, Michigan Central stands as a symbol for the potential of the American auto industry, driven by the vision of another Ford, William Clay Ford, the great grandson of patriarch Henry Ford. I think it's, you know, obviously it's a family company, Bill's vision, uh, but also the train station is very much a symbol, a, a kind of um, a mark along our journey to, to, to create a great company. And, we avoided bankruptcy, which was amazing in the early 2000s, mid-2000s, but to build a vibrant company, you know, in the EV world, the digital vehicle world, the train station felt like the right kind of challenger project for Ford to be part of so that we could be part of the, you know, revitalization of Detroit, which had really been kind of used by almost the national media as an example of the decay of the country. And, and this felt like the kind of project that would be emblematic of our recovery as a company. With the U.S. auto industry and the city of Detroit on the rise again, the question is whether it can continue on its path. Can it avoid the tunnel vision, born of pride, that led it to stumble 50 years ago? Like its competitors, Ford has concluded that its path to the future lies through solving the riddle of electric vehicles. And that is where we turn next on Wall Street Week, to the perplexing question of how and when to make that transition to an electric future. At the beginning of the 20th century, the United States radically changed how we move people and cargo around. It was the dawn of the internal combustion engine, pioneered by people like Henry Ford. And it changed our economy and our world. At that time, Ford was the pinnacle we had 80% market share globally of the car business. We were working on our second vehicle called the Model A, built at the Rouge. We're going from, you know, the moving assembly line, but, but basically buying our parts from other people to a completely integrated uh, plant at the Rouge. In 1908, when Ford began producing the Model T, there were only about 200,000 registered cars and trucks in all the United States. In less than 20 years, that number had exploded to over 17 million. And today, it's edging toward 300 million, or around nine cars for every 10 people. Now, many see another transportation revolution, one that will rival or even exceed that of 100 years ago. 
But if you were to say, go out 20 years, overwhelmingly, things are electric autonomous, overwhelmingly. Ironically, Tesla was not the true pioneer in electric vehicles. General Motors introduced its EV1 back in 1996. That experiment was quickly abandoned, and the Detroit automakers returned to their core businesses of internal combustion engines, a business on the upswing again, thanks in no small part to help from the government during the great financial crisis. I was young staffer on the transition operation, standing before the forefront of this new administration. Michigan Congresswoman Haley Stevens served in the Obama administration, which faced the imminent demise of the U.S. auto industry back in 2009. All I could do in my spare time is read the Detroit Free Press uh, online and look back to what was going on in Michigan, in my hometown. This was very, very uh, troubling, scary, and unique, in part because the word bankruptcy started to enter the sentence as it related to General Motors and to Chrysler. And particularly, to hear the words General Motors and bankruptcy in a sentence was foreign and newfound territory. And so I knew that if I was going to serve in the administration of Barack Obama, I had to do something for Michigan. Uh, it was catastrophic. But now comes the hard part, converting to a world of electric vehicles. And there is a long way to go. Tesla led the way, going from 19,000 EV sales in 2013 to 1.8 million a decade later. GM, Stellantis, and Ford are trying to catch up and are growing their EV businesses, but off of a much lower base, selling around 150,000 EVs in the United States in 2023, or less than 3% of their output. EV success will require a fundamental rewiring of all the car companies, including Ford. We're well into the messy middle of the most transformational time other than the Model T. You know, we've never gone through this electrification transition for low CO2 drivetrains. We've never had a digital product before. We never could give people time back like we will with level three autonomy. Um, we're investing in all that enabling technology. We're very profitable with our pro business and, and our combustion business. I'd say, you know, we're just a few years away from another vibrant period for the company. And as leaders, we see it before everyone else sees it. And so it's, it's exciting for us, but we feel a tremendous amount of responsibility for your parents, uh, for you, for my grandparents. Reinventing a huge legacy company takes money and lots of it. Ford has said that it plans to invest $22 billion in electrification through 2025. And in 2021, GM set a bold target of transitioning its entire fleet to EVs by 2035, all to make a product the vast majority of consumers have yet to embrace. I'm so proud of our domestic automakers for continuing to innovate, continuing to lead the way. They've doubled down on particularly electric vehicles in the plight towards zero emissions. They've made the strategic investments. And the automakers that we have today, as we head into the year 2025, are so different than the automakers of the turn of the century. The world is moving towards electric vehicles. We're seeing this in markets on all continents. We want the United States automakers and workers to be leading the way. We want them to be dealt in. Ford's Jim Farley admits the traditional U.S. automakers have a long way to go, but insists they are making progress. The growth in the U.S. is still, you know, we were up 30, 40 percent in electric sales. We're number two in the U.S. to Tesla. Uh, we're also number three in hybrids. We're the only company that kind of you can buy an F-150 electric or a hybrid or or a V8, you know, it's your choice. And so we've learned a lot from customers. I think what's happened is we're in the mainstream customer. And the mainstream customer is totally different than the early adopters. That consumer resistance to the next round of EV sales has caused Ford and the other U.S. automakers to trim back their aggressive goals, at least for the time being. With Ford announcing it will entirely shut down its plans for an all-electric SUV at a cost of over $4 billion. 
something Congresswoman Stevens monitors closely, even as she remains sure of where things are headed over the long run. None of us fully know how the consumers are going to embrace electric vehicles. I know any time I get with uh, an automaker, I'm asking, you know, how are these cars being sold? What needs to be done? But one thing is very clear. The world is moving towards electric vehicles. Whatever resistance some consumers may have to EVs, Ted Canis, president of Ford Pro, the commercial arm of the company, says the story is very different for businesses running fleets of trucks, vans, and emergency vehicles. A retail customer is making the decision of choice. It might be a very personal decision about their own commitment to what they like out of fast cars. But in a business, it's a business. You're trying to improve fuel costs, run maintenance, enter a quiet neighborhood in, in the working hours. There's real business reasons to have an electric vehicle. Given what Canis says about commercial demand, it's no surprise that his Ford Pro is now the company's most profitable unit. The challenge is keeping up with the demand. The demand remains so strong, but it's for the rest of this year, I see it's going to be a backlog. Do you have any concern that that may give an opportunity to competitors? If they can't get the vehicles they want when they want to get it, they might go someplace else. That has been a concern, but there's no question that if there's open capacity, people prefer our product. Whether on the consumer or the commercial side, the transformation to electric is about more than just propulsion and connectivity. The manufacturing process itself is fundamentally different, which could come at the cost of some employment. A major issue in the last collective bargaining agreement with the UAW, and something that the congresswoman who represents many of the Detroit area auto workers has very much in mind. We're certainly seeing some volatility in the, the market. I'm eyeing Stellantis very closely, uh, in part because as they're transitioning, they're winding down some manufacturing. They're, then they're announcing job layoffs. They've got tight contracts, but there's also uh, some tough conversations that are taking place, even though those contracts have been set. In part, we don't want to be ushering in anything that isn't fair for the hardworking men and women of our auto industry. As if making the transition to EVs weren't hard enough, the Detroit automakers are doing it in the face of stiff competition, first from Tesla and now from Chinese EV makers, with BYD alone now producing over three million cars last year and threatening to export their much less expensive models into the United States, something the Biden administration says it will at least slow down by imposing tariffs of over 100 percent. For his part, the Ford CEO says that he doesn't object to the competition, provided it's fair. I've been doing this for 40 years. I worked for Toyota for a couple decades. I've never seen a competition like this. They have full sponsorship of their government. The government bet on EVs before anyone else in the world. They are the largest market in the world, and now they're the most important market in the world. We can compete and win against them, but we have to bring our A game, and we have to learn a lot of new things. This will be the ultimate test of companies like Ford for the next 100 years. I fully believe we can do it. It's been a long journey for the auto industry and for Detroit, from the peaks of production, employment, and profitability of the mid-1900s to the deep valleys at the end of the century. Now it looks like it's truly regained some momentum and some of that pride that it lost. But the industry and Detroit may have their biggest challenges still ahead. We've talked about a very proud time for yes. Detroit and for Ford, uh, and then losing some of that pride with sort of losing the way, both for Detroit and for Ford. How do you make sure you don't lose it again? How do you make sure you don't make the same mistake in a different time in a different place? This is the, this is the most important question for a CEO. And I think really the only answer is culture. Um, it can't depend on me. It has to depend on kind of the, the heart and soul of our workforce who comes in every day and their commitment to quality and cost is really only the in, only way to be enduring and sustainable. Great companies like Toyota did that to empower the factory worker to pull the end on cord when they saw something wrong. And the only way I believe to sustain that at Ford is not me. The future of Detroit can't depend on any single person or any single company. At its best, the story of the auto industry over the last century and more has been one of innovation and investment. 
but it requires not letting unimaginable success lead to complacency. As Andy Grove said, complacency breeds failure. Only the paranoid survive. Next on Wall Street Week, a story about the restaurant business and the people behind it. This is a story about what makes the restaurant business work, when it all belongs. Food that appeals, the right atmosphere, people who make us feel welcome, prices we are willing to pay, and in the end, revenue to cover costs and make a profit. It can be a tough business, but ultimately, like any good recipe, it works only when it all comes together, all driven by a vision that turns a business into a calling. I'm born, bred, and buttered in Harlem, and 114th Street, and Frederick Douglass was one of the most notorious drug blocks in the community. There's a school down the block, like halfway, midway down the block, and it broke my heart to know that school kids on their way to school to learn had to witness that type of activity. And I always said, you know, I complained about it. And I'm like, but what am I gonna do about it? Melba Wilson is one of those who had a vision, which led her to start her own restaurant in Harlem. As much for the sake of the neighborhood, is for the food. My parents are from the South. My father's from a very, very small town, three stoplights, Hemingway, South Carolina. So they grew up saving money under their mattress. You know, they didn't trust the banks. So what did I do when I got paid, whether it was at Sylvia's or Rosa Mexicano or Windows on the World? I, every Friday when I got paid, I put a little bit under my mattress. This particular day, I said, let me see how much I've saved up. Well, I started counting and counting and counting. Then I got scared. I'm like, oh my God, this is a lot of money. I would saved up $312,000. In cash? In cash. $5 bills, $1 bills, 20 hundreds. But I said, what am I going to do with this? And I decided to change my neighborhood, to be the change that I wanted to see. It's not just Harlem that's been changed by restaurants like Melba's. Restaurateur Danny Meyer, creator of the famed Union Square Cafe and Gramercy Tavern, says the New York restaurant business overall is thriving, often driven by connections to particular neighborhoods all over the city. And I think people more and more crave getting out to restaurants. In my entire career, I have never seen our restaurants nearly as full as they are today. A restaurant won't make it without the passion and vision of a Danny Meyer or a Melba Wilson but it also has to make it as a business. So Miley, tell us about the restaurant business. How does the restaurant business work? What drives it? I mean, this is a tough business. It's a small margin business. And I think as customers, we're probably not always aware of just how much it takes to make a restaurant successful. Miley Carpenter is the founding editor-in-chief of Food Network Magazine. And she says as tough as the business is, it's also essential to the economic dynamism of cities like New York. I can't express how important the restaurant scene is to the energy and the, like, it's, it's our lifeblood, it's everything to New York. There are over 700,000 restaurant businesses in the United States, bringing in revenues approaching $90 billion a month, or about 4.6% of national GDP. Nationwide, restaurants employ over 12 million people, according to the Department of Labor, making it the sixth largest labor sector in the country. But as important as restaurants are to our economy and to our everyday lives, many were driven to the point of extinction when the pandemic hit in early 2020. The pandemic brought really the entire industry, and I would say especially in New York City, brought us to our knees because we were not allowed to have revenue outside of some piddly things like, can you sell a bottle of wine out the door? And horribly, and one of the toughest things to reconcile was being a, an employee first company and then being in a position where the only way to stay in business was to lay off a huge, huge percentage of our company. In New York City alone, restaurants employed over 300,000 workers before the pandemic hit, but nearly half of those lost their jobs when the city shut down. Many restaurants didn't survive the crisis, and the rest had to make immediate changes to their businesses to keep them alive. Because we had 20% 25% seating after a while when we reopen. Then we put a lot of greenery. We turned the place into a jungle to just feel good inside. And outside we put tables with bungalow. And in the bungalow we had heaters in the winter. We had air conditioning in the summer. 
music inside the bungalow. And then we start to reopen our restaurant little by little. But uh, it took a while to bring back everybody, for sure. The pandemic upended the world of commercial real estate and with it, the restaurants that depend on it, with much of the industry still struggling to recover as people have been slow to return to the office, something that has both affected restaurants near those offices and created a potential incentive to get people to come back. We have diversified quite a bit our business model, especially going through COVID. I think we've learned the hard way that, because Daniel old model was we all own and operate it, like he owns the expression physically, the walls and everything else. There comes a lot of uh, obligation to do this. Sebastian Silvestri is CEO of Dynex, which runs Daniel Belude's company. He says restaurants like Belude's can be a magnet for office workers. I'm gonna take like one like Kessel Green, for example, the one of our partner, and they have those spectacular building like one Vanderbilt, one Madison, they're trying to get tenant in, they're trying to bring people back to work in the office, that's their whole business. They need to bring world-class amenities and then they come to people like us and say, hey, what could we do here? But I think uh, a company like SL Green or, or larger commercial real estate company, they need world-class amenity and then this is when they come to us. So it's been a win-win for, for them and for us. As hard as the pandemic hit commercial real estate, one might think rents for restaurants would come down. But Danny Meyer says he hasn't seen that in New York. Interestingly, the street side rents are not down at all. It almost seems like whatever struggles developers and landlords are having getting office tenants to come back, they're taking out on the people who are on the street, the retail people. So I would say that it's not necessarily a better time to open a restaurant than it was. But I have no question at all that the restaurants that have opened post-pandemic have been some of the most exciting vintage that we've ever seen in New York City. Anyone who opened a restaurant after the pandemic had a very, very real sense of where their neighborhood was at that point. So that was a much better thing. Well, in, in other businesses, that would cause a renegotiation of that 20-year lease. Oh, we tried, we tried. With what success? Uh, modest, <laughs> modest. Look, landlords have the best subscription business in the world, it doesn't matter whether it's raining, they're going to get their rent. And it doesn't matter whether there's an economic downturn, they're going to get their rent. So it's a, it's a good business to be in. And unfortunately, in New York City, one of the things that I find quite frustrating is that a lot of the landlords would rather warehouse their space waiting for a sunny day. And so that's not necessarily good for the, the streetscape of the city. Despite all the challenges and uncertainties of running a restaurant, there are some that not only succeed, but succeed year after year and become a part of the DNA of New York City. Something that New York restaurateurs like Danny Meyer and Danielle Boulud have shown over decades, with Danny starting Union Square Cafe back in 1985 when he was just 27, and Danielle Boulud opening Danielle eight years later. We don't want to disorient the customer neither uh, disorient our team, but we want to continue to progress and keep a, a level of excellence always and a style of cooking that belong to us, uh, uh, Daniel, me, myself, my team. So there's always a French DNA in what we do. And yet, you know, after so many years in America, there is this temptation of borrowing flavors. Like right now, we are doing a beef dish and we're using miso as a curing and seasoning and flavoring around it. I can t t talk about a place like Daniel, so it's 31 years, so there's a, a lot of people that have been with Daniel for a long time. And I think that's the success in the restaurant industry. That's what I tell people all the time is, when you have good people, your job is to retain them, take good care of them, make sure they're happy, uh, give them you know, uh, care and love and support and give them a career. But every time we open a new place, it's like you have to start almost from scratch. Uh, and, you know, every restaurant is an enterprise in itself. You know, a restaurant like Daniela employ over 100 people. Same with Le Pavillon, same with Café Boulou, same with Central New York. So every restaurant is a business of it on its own. You know, I'm so proud of the fact that our two, uh, I was going to say oldest, but our, our two senior restaurants <laughs> Union Square Cafe is going to be 40 years old in 2025. Gramercy Tavern is going to be 30 this year. The Modern is 20 this year. And Shake Shack's going to be 20 this year. So that's pretty good. And what I'm really proudest about 
is that in a city whose first name is new, where people definitely want to talk about what's new, have you been to any new restaurants? They love that. That's, that's part of it. But I think what any restaurant strives to do that, that is here for keeps or that wants to be here for keeps, that wants to become an institution in this, this amazing city, if you go to 10 restaurants, I'm going to expect that seven of those 10 restaurants are restaurants you've never been to because it's fun to discover a new place. I want to be one of the three that make your list, the rotation that you go back to. And you go back to them because your favorite restaurant, like mine, is the one that loves you the most. As you've watched restaurants come and go over the years, is there some sort of rule of thumb of which ones work and which ones don't work? I mean, I'm always fascinated by this, and when I'm eating out, I'm uh, looking around, kind of, what is, what's making this place packed? Why is no one here when the food is great? And it, it's this sort of magical combination of elements, and I think it's changing. And so restaurants that are able to quickly adapt to the way we eat now versus how we ate before COVID or how we ate 10 years ago, those are the ones that tend to survive. And when I look now at, at which restaurants are really, you know, packing people in and able to keep them there, I mean, there's so many elements. I think fun is a, is a very important element that wasn't as important maybe 10 years ago. Um, an element of sort of levity. When we go out to eat, we want to be entertained. Surprise, hugely important. Think about the restaurant experiences that you go tell other people about. It's an element of surprise. It was something, something grabbed you, whether it was a little gift when you left, just that little something that makes you tell a story. I mean, I think the best restaurants are storytellers. Whether it's surprise or fun or a story, it all has to come together and make us feel welcome. When people come to a restaurant, they want to belong. They want to feel like if they've been there before, they want to know that you recognize that. They want to feel seen. I don't think it's ever going to change. People want a, a hug, a virtual hug, but they want to know that you are happy to see them back there. And in a time when there's more alienation, and if you can point your finger at social media, work from home, whatever you want to talk about. I think restaurants are one of the great places that they're almost like a town hall that bring people together and restaurants can recognize you and can be that part of your day that, that just makes you feel happy that you're in New York City. And when all the pieces belong together, restaurants can help transform a community or a city. We felt the loss when the pandemic hit and perhaps we appreciate the connection all the more now that we can return to our favorite restaurant. Next on Wall Street Week, Larry Summers of Harvard on the Fed's big decision to cut rates. This week, the Fed delivered the rate cut that investors have been counting on and more when it cut the federal funds rate by a full 50 basis points, just like the Fed under Alan Greenspan did back in April of 2001. The Fed, which nearly put out all the lights with its untimely tightening a year ago, now finally seems to have recognized the error of its ways and has, as of Wednesday, fully reversed all those increases hinting strongly that this belated unraveling does indeed have further to go. This still tacit admission received a standing ovation from investors who were already in a good mood. Indeed, Nasdaq had climbed another 5.4 percent in the less than 90 minutes before the Fed announced its surprise fourth half-point rate cut of the year. Why, next thing you know, Alan Greenspan may be listed as the producer of a carefree revival of that evergreen farce, irrational exuberance. That was Louis Rukeyser on the original Wall Street Week. Joining us now is former Treasury Secretary and Wall Street Week special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, great to talk to you, particularly this week, given what the Fed did. What did you make of it? You know, I think this got, frankly, more attention than it deserved. It was clear that the Fed was going to cut rates. It's clear that the Fed's beginning a rate cycle. Just what the timing of just how much rates are cut this month relative to next month, relative to in December, is ultimately not consequential for the economy. You can see that in the fact that uh, longer-term interest rates have changed uh, very little in response to 
uh, what has happened. So I think it was a close call on one on cutting rates by 25 or by 50. This time, I'd have probably saved some optionality by not cutting them 50 this time, but I don't think it's a very consequential decision because if it's more now, it'll be less a little later. If, if it had been less now, it could easily have been more a little later. I think the larger story is that it does appear that while the Fed was late to respond to the gathering inflationary threat, that it responded in time and expectations ultimately remained relatively well anchored. And so this episode, while it's very painful for people in terms of higher prices, even in terms of reduced incomes, has not been as damaging to stability as looked likely some time ago. And I think that's a reflection of how anchored expectations were by decades of uh, price stability and the fact that when the Fed started to move, it moved quite decisively. Uh, Larry, in fairness to you, last time we talked about this on this program, you said you thought it would be 25, but you thought the case for 50 was getting stronger. So you were moving in that direction already in your prediction. Is it too early for Chair Powell to declare victory on that soft landing? Look, I, I think that there are no final victories in uh, economics. It's certainly the case that inflation has come down more with less reduction, less increase in unemployment than seemed likely to me and to most other observers a year and a half or two years ago. Whether inflation is ultimately going to stay down, especially with the risks that would come if we had big new tariffs or other kinds of policy lurches, I don't think that's certain. Whether we're going to avoid recession, you know, ultimately at some point, There'll, there'll be another recession. My suspicion is that it's not yet in sight and that it's not being caused by forces that are yet at play, but that's not a certainty. So I think the Fed can certainly take uh, some satisfaction in how things have gone over the last year and a half, but I think it's always a mistake for policymakers to be complacent much less to start popping champagne. Uh, Larry, one of the things you've raised a concern about ongoing is the estimated neutral rate or long-term rate here. And I did see in the statement of economic projections, they took it up but from 2.8 to 2.9 for the longer term. Uh, do you, are you still concerned that the Fed may be underestimating the long-term neutral rate? Yeah, I am. I, I think that Chairman Powell made a comment in this direction during his press conference, and I think that was welcome and probably appropriate. I don't think that uh, it's likely that the neutral rate is as low as the Fed believes. They've marked it up only 40 basis points from its level before COVID, and yet we've had huge increases in wealth, vast changes in the budget deficit, in the level of the national debt, We've seen major new signs of increased investment in, green, in the green sector, in AI, and in energy generation. And so you take all those pressures downwards on saving and upwards on investment, and I think the neutral real rate has gone up. And I think given the kinds of things that may come in the future in terms of protectionist policy, given the inflation that we have been through, you have to think that even if 2% inflation is a reasonable guess as to where, where things settle, before we used to think the risk was to the downside, now I think we've got to think that the risk is to the upside. So if you take all of that together, my guess is that you're looking at a neutral rate with a four handle. And in that context, monetary policy isn't as contractionary as people often say it is, or as I think the Fed believes it is. That, by the way, is the reason why the economy has stayed so strong, because monetary policy hasn't actually been that contractionary when properly measured. And I think the risks of actually going as far with monetary policy as the Fed seems to think that it will 
are pretty significant in terms of having an increase in inflation. We had some more economic news on the presidential election front this week, as we have President, former President Trump uh, saying both that he'd eliminate the salt tax, which is popular in places like New York and New Jersey, as you can imagine, as well as eliminate the overtime tax. Uh, are, are these responsible economic policies? Look, you can argue both sides on the salt tax. President Trump was a strong advocate for eliminating the deduction. And when, two months before an election, he's switching gears on that, it looks pretty purely like a political maneuver. I don't think there's any rational tax policy argument at all for eliminating taxes on overtime pay, their income. People have all sorts of income. And it's the road to ruin if we start saying some types of income should be taxed and some types of income shouldn't be taxed, it was a dumb idea to eliminate the taxes on tips. And this is a similarly uh, foolish uh, kind of uh, idea. Tax policy should be based on some set of principles around the definition of income. The one thing that almost all economists agree on is that it's better to have as broad a tax base as possible and then to have low tax rates rather than exclude lots of categories of income from taxation and then, in order to raise revenue, be forced to jack up the rates on everything else. Thanks so very much to Larry Summers of Harvard. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. See you next week.